So you go away from fall break, that's you know, Monday and Tuesday, and then that Thursday of that week, that's we'll have that retake. So that means that, um, you know, so you'll have the midterm on Tuesday, we'll have another lecture uh, on Thursday, a week from today, then there's fall break, and then there'll be the retake. So between the midterm and the retake, you should at least see the solution sets for the midterm, and if the Scantron comes back quickly enough, you should maybe be able to see, uh, be able to see how well you did. And, uh, and then if I, I might even be able to post which questions that you had issues with uh, because of, um, they come back to me in a nice format like that, but I just kind of have to restructure it and make it, you know, anon anonymizable. Uh, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to get that back to you before the retake. And then the retake will be a different exam, but it'll be over the same content. It'll be you know, very similar in format, but uh, uh, it will, uh, so, if you've studied for the midterm, we're pretty confident that it'll be the same sort of study and will be you know, adequate for the retake and vice versa. So that's the plan moving forward. Um, there are a bunch of midterm resources on Canvas, and so I've posted three sample midterms and their solution sets. Uh, two of them are from back before I started using Scantron, and one is a Scantron example. Uh, there are the homework solution sets are on Canvas, uh, or at least the D2 solutions that will be available by this weekend. Uh, because D2 is, a, is I think, uh, whenever D2 is due, it's the, you know, immediately shows up the, you know, the minute after the, the YouTube window closes. And then there's, uh, now, uh, the ICAF was due before, which is like a practice ICA over all the pre-midterm material. It was due before this lecture, but once it disappeared, a new ICA that's a practice ICA, ICAF practice should have showed up. And that is identical to ICAF, it just doesn't count for any points. But it'll still score you, but your scores just don't get put into the grade book. And so you can take that as many times as you want. And then if, uh, this is kind of an older version of the Canvas, uh, so it's a little different now, but on Canvas, all the lectures are associated with book chapters. And so if there is any, if you, if you, you know, there's something in, say, lecture B1 that uh, just it still seems murky, then, you know, look in chapter three and maybe the way the book authors have put it together will be a little more clear. And of course, when I've tried my best to do the audio and the video of every lecture, all of those are up on Canvas as well. You should do want to review those lectures. So, we've got a lot of material there. Hopefully, everything's going to feel prepped and there'll be no surprises when the uh, midterm comes up. So, before I cover the couple of slides we missed, are there any questions about the scheduling moving forward? Midterms in this classroom at this time at normal lecture time. All right, so the stuff we missed, so we were talking about the inverse transform method and we covered all the continuous transforms. So, like this exponential here, you know, that you'll solve for the CDF of an exponential and invert it. You can then turn a uniformly distributed random number into an exponential just by running it through the inverse uh, or the quantile function, the inverse CDF here. And so the question is, what if I have a discrete distribution that I would like to sample from? And so a discrete distribution very often will be given by just its probability mass function. Well, we're going to do the analogous transformation for the discrete case. And so you, you have the PMF, so the first thing we need is the CDF. And so we convert a PMF to a CDF. So on a midterm, I could give you a PMF and ask you to sample from, I might... Uh, you know, as you can see, I think I've done examples of this on previous midterms where I'll give someone a random number from 0 to 1, and I'll say, assuming this was your random number that Excel or Arena gave you, uh, you, you build a formula that would give you a replicate that uh, is a, consistent with this probability mass function using the inverse transform method, and then I'll be looking for the right outcome. And so 
So your answer is going to be one, two, or a three. So you get a number like 0.34, and then you have to figure out, do I want to answer a one, two, or a three for this 0.34 input? So how do I do that now? So the first thing you do is generate the CDF. You just do that by adding up all the PMS uh, in a cumulative fashion. So you start out with 0.2. You add 0.5 to it to get 0.7. You add 0.3 to it to get 1. And then from there, that's going to end up setting up these cut points that tell us where to group certain random numbers with certain outcomes. So, uh, it, you know, visually what's going on here is this is our graphical depiction of the CDF. Here's our three outcomes here. And here are the probabilities, of, uh, the, the cumulative the, uh, probabilities associated with each outcome, 0.2. 0.7 and 1. So reading straight up here, I just have the CDF. And so I start with that discrete CDF, and then I, you know, if I was doing this on paper, then I would technically would invert it. And so graphically, all I did was just switch the axis. I just, uh, just imagine there's an axis going through the diagonal, and I just rotate it around that. So I go back, it looks like this, then I'm going to flip it this way. So that it flips up like that, so that now my independent variable is this draw. And if I just go up here, then I can end up seeing that, well, if I draw a point whatever, a point, say, 6, then it goes up and it hits this curve here, which maps to outcome 2. So that's uh, well, 0.54, I guess, to the outcome that I drew in this example. And so uh, so that is kind of graphically what we're, what's going on here. Now, uh, how, you know, so this, this CDF gives you the boundaries for transforming this. So basically this shows you that anything from 0 to 0 0.2 would go to an outcome 1. Anything from 0.2 to 0.7 would go to outcome 2. Anything from 0.7 to 1 would go to outcome 3. And then that will end up generating them with the right probability because this has got, we wanted outcome 2 to be most frequent and that's got the biggest interval. So that's how that works. So if I want to see that not graphically, so you know how to do it sort of mathematically, then I can set up these cut points of these inequalities here. And I basically just write the CDF down here. And I say anything from zero to the first spot in the CDF gets that first outcome. Anything from that spot to the next spot in the CDF gets the next outcome. And anything from that spot to the end gets the third outcome. So I've just taken these CDF values here and I've written them down this way to create those intervals that I've showed you graphically. Like I said, it just creates these kind of cut points here. And then in Arena, if you ever wanted to do that, rather than implementing this logic manually, they have this convenient function called disk, or for discrete. And actually, you can type in the whole word discrete, and that works as well. And if you look at it, it actually is encoding the inverse CDF in its arguments here. So the first argument is a probability, the second argument is an output. Then a probability and an outcome, a probability and an outcome. So it's the inverse CDF, or if you prefer, it's just the CDF with the argument switch. So I've got all my outcomes on the even arguments, and all the corresponding CDF probabilities on the odd arguments. And this, if you encode, if you, like if I put this example into Arena in an expression somewhere, like let's say the expression is figuring out the number of uh, customers who've arrived, or maybe it's figuring out the service time for a particular order. And I know that those service times, well, there's only really three service times you care about, but this one happens more frequently than the other two. Well, I can just encode this in that C's delay release is the delay, and it will then draw outcome two more frequently, 50% of the time, but it will occasionally draw outcomes three and outcomes one as well. So you should become familiar with this, and we, it wouldn't surprise me if on the midterm, I haven't written the midterm yet, but there would be questions that, that maybe have, you know, that make sure that you're familiar with this notation so that you know that, you know, coming, that you can go from a CDF into Arena and back. And so one, a big thing to note here, a lot of people will get confused by this disk function because they think that these are the mass functions. They think it's like encoding the PMF. But the disk is encoding the CDF. So all of these probabilities have to increase. It has to go 0 0.2, 0 0.71. It can't go 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. If you tried to do that, Arena would give you an error saying that these have to be monotonic. They also always have to end in 1. Um, now, you sometimes get an odd argument out here. So sometimes you see comma 3, and then comma, and then something else. 
Does anybody remember what that extra argument is with any of these random functions in Arena? I think I heard someone say it. It's the seed or the stream identifier. So in Arena, you can define streams, and each stream can have its own seed in random number configuration. And so you can tack on right to the end of this the stream, but if you don't do that, it defaults to 10. So, uh, so if you do ever see a disk here and it has an odd number of arguments, that's because the last argument, the odd man out here, is that stream identifier. So any questions about this, about how you could go from a probability mass function to an outcome and how you might encode that in Arena so that it can do this process for you? All right, so we can use that disk function and this sort of uh, this, this general process to actually help us work with data that even when the data are not discreetly described, so even when the data do not necessarily come from a discrete distribution, we can still approximate them by a discrete distribution. And that ends up making it more convenient for us to sample from something if we're not quite sure what the real continuous distribution is. So let me let me get, you know, make that a little clearer here. So we've already when we talked about the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, I introduced this phrase, empirical cumulative distribution function, or the empirical CDF, otherwise known as the sample CDF. And I said that the sample CDF, and you get, get it from taking, let's say I had capital N number of samples, and I just sort them so the indices are always in this order. So this isn't the first data point I sampled, this is the lowest uh, in, the, in the set, and this is the highest. And then after I sort them, I then can create a function, or basically create a graph, which maps every outcome to its position in the list, divided by the length of the list. And this here will end up having all of the properties that we need of a discrete CDF. And so with, so as an example here, you can kind of view this as I've got all of these outcomes over here, and even if we know it's drawn from a continuous distribution, as far as we know from the data, it might as well have been a really, really fine-grained discrete distribution that only had these outcomes in its probability mass function. And we can associate with each one of those one over capital N probability mass. It's like it's a uniform distribution across these discrete outcomes. And then that would give us this cumulative distribution where it's hard to read one over capital N, two over capital N, I over capital N, all the way up to N over capital N. And so this is one way we can approximate these data that we came in as a discrete distribution, even if it's not really discrete. And the benefit of that is that now if we were to plot this, so this is these are data I brought in, and as far as I know, these came from a continuous distribution, but after I sampled from the data, let's say I wasn't really sure what continuous distribution it was going to use, and, and I didn't know how to fit one, or I just didn't really have a good fit. Well, then I, you know, I need to go somewhere. So I'd say, at least for my prototype simulation, I want to just sample from a discrete distribution that uses these outcomes. So at least I get the same outcomes that I got in my data with the same frequency that I got in my data. And that's what this is representing here, this empirical CDF. And so with this empirical CDF, I can still draw a, a number between 0 and 1 and map it to an outcome. Question. How you, how you read them? Yeah. Like, like, like the meaning of this graph? Is that, yes. Yeah. So yeah, down here, these are all of the possible outcomes. And they jump up. So outcomes that have probability mass in them correspond to these steps. So of course, I've, I've only written out on the axes the outcomes that occurred here. But I you know outcome point one is here. But it's flat, so it doesn't have any probability mass associated. So every time you get a step, the step is actually proportional to the probability mass. In this case, all the steps are of equal height because I'm saying that I only saw one of each one of these in my data set. So I'm uniformly distributing probability over these five values. But if I saw 0.25, say, four times in the data set, this step would be much higher. In, yeah, in all of these, graphically, that's all you do is you, well, yeah, I guess you could, regardless of discrete or continuous, if you have pairs, you just flip the order of the pairs. 
you had a graph, you just did the answer. The only, the, the difficulty, as you did on the homework is in homework G2, was when you want to then analytically solve for a function that matches this graph, that's when you have to go into, you know, maybe a little bit extra effort. But if you have the graph, uh, and you're, you, you have a mechanism for doing it more graphically, then if you just flip everything, then that's enough. So, uh, and does that answer this, this clear about how we, what the empirical CDF is with outcomes down here, and then the probability, the frequency of those outcomes is accumulated here. So now that I've generated this sample CDF, if I draw a random number between zero and one, I do the same trick I've been doing for everything else. I just say, which outcome is, uh, the, if I were to sample here, which outcome does that match? And so anything between 0.4 and 0.6 is going to map to 0.4 on this. Anything between 0.2 and 0.4 is going to map to 0.35. Anything between 0 and 0.2 is going to map to 0.25. And so this gives me a way of generating simulated data that matches the proportions of the data in my real sample set without even coming up with a curve. And so the outcome will end up looking like this. So I uh, took these data and I put them into a disk line, just like the one that I showed you before. So this disk line in general is going to look that like this down here, where I've got the probability 1 over n, comma the outcome, comma 2 over n, comma the outcome, all the way up to 1.0, comma the, comma the outcome. And so if I then had arena, generated a lot of these, then I would end up getting a histogram that might look like this. So maybe, uh, in this case, uh, all of these, I, this is sort of a small sample set, but um, if I did have samples that were more frequent than others, then some of these bars would be a lot higher than others. But, you know, but yeah, question? You mean like, like if I drew a point two, all the way to point two five, or um, does it include? I guess. Right, sorry, like the estimate of the point five or point one. Um, I would so I would say that the if you drew a point, it actually doesn't matter uh, if you drew a point two exactly, but everything from zero to and then the open interval point two will end up mapping to point two five, and then. I would say from 0.2 to the open interval of 0.4 would map to 0.35 and so on. But it turns out that what you do with these individual points uh, doesn't matter in the end because they happen with zero probability. But um, yeah, so, so, and I won't ever ask you a question from Juan Bowser. Like that would just be a trick question. Um, so, yeah, discrete, was there another question? Um, and so this is what you would end up getting simulated data out. So I, I measured these data. I asked Arena to generate data, to generate samples from a distribution matching these proportions, and it gave me these five values out. Now the downside of this is I said, well, you know, I, that's that's technically what I asked for, but I really want this to approximate a continuous distribution that just happens to sort of show these outcomes with the same proportionality that they have. But I still want other outcomes. Like, it, you know, if I'm approximating a continuous distribution and I've only looked at a small sample set, this would not be a good approximation of a continuous distribution because I would never get values in between here. When I would just, if I only took a couple of data points, I was just unlucky to never get them in between here. So one option, if you can't take more data, is uh, Arena gives another uh, command called cont. C-O-N-T for continuous. And it has exactly the same format as this, but it interpolates in the CDF between each one of these points. So before, if I go back, the CDF had all these stair steps. So all this cog function is doing is it's drawing a line between all these corners here to generate a continuous distribution. And still, at every corner, that each one of these outcomes in each one of these corners will have the same proportionality that it did in the real data set. But now it will throw in additional points 
in between that are consistent with that. And what sometimes you see done here is, if you notice how it goes with disk, I start with one over n. But in the continuous one, if I started with that one over n, which I can do, it ends up basically making this outcome be the minimum outcome. And there's like a huge probability mass that's sitting on top of the minimum outcome. And everything else gets smoothly spread out over all of these other outcomes. And that's often not desirable. So if you have a priori information that you should expect a different minimum, like let's say 0.25 is the minimum I saw in my data, but I'm pretty sure I could have gotten all the way down to zero, then I can start what I talked about with zero comma that hypothetical minimum. And then that will end up putting this line down here, and then that gives me a smooth distribution all the way from zero up to my maximum value of 0.95. But it has these kind of funny steps in the P, so the approximation of the probability mass function, uh, because it's sort of uniformly interpolating between these outcomes. So it's the difference in just, in other words, it's just putting a straight line in the CDF. So that's disk and cons. Cons is just a way to smooth out disk if all you have is a small number of data points that you assume are from a continuous distribution, but you don't have any way of fitting it to a known continuous distribution that you can otherwise generate with an inverse transform. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. All right, and then so there's one other case is that sometimes we do have nice formulas for discrete random variables. As an example, the geometric distribution, you'll remember what the geometric distribution is. It's a random variable, which is the number of, if I've got a number of coin flips, of weighted coin flips, my question is, how many coin flips do I need for a certain number of successes? So I would like to see five heads. How many coin flips do I have to flip with a fair coin or with a maybe 75% heads coin in order for me to see five heads eventually. And uh, that's what this uniform, that's what this uh, PMS, PMF uh, gives us, and this is what the CDF gives us, and this is the plot of the CDF. So we've got these two, uh, and so, you know, graphically, of course, I can, you know, I could still do this, but if I think about it mathematically, I've got a way in which I can, encapsulate that in a much more elegant form. I know the formulas for each one of these stair steps. And so I can say what I really want is the outcome k that sandwiches the random number that I grab between the CDF at outcome k and the CDF at the next outcome. So I can see my CDF here, f of k is 1 minus 1 minus p to the k plus 1. So that's what showed up here plugged in k here, I plugged in k plus 1 here. And now, I get in theory, I should be able to solve these two equations, this equation and that equation, simultaneously, and to get an idea of what bounds I have on R that correspond to each outcome k. I have a nice closed form expression. So if I do that, then I end up getting, so if I solve both of these simultaneously, I end up getting something that looks like this. And if you look closely at this thing, this is saying, if you keep in mind that k has to be an integer, then I'm saying I need to find the integer that fits within these two bounds, and I can use the ceiling function to represent exactly what's going on here. So this, if you've never seen this before, this operator, so this thing that kind of looks like an absolute value, but it has little hat on both sides, that's the ceiling, which is the smallest integer that is at least as big as the thing inside the operator, so the ceiling. And so then I end up getting, the, I, so I, I take my R that I calculated, that I got from my random number generator, I plug it into this formula, which gives me some number on the real line, and then I end up taking the integer that is at the smallest integer that is least as large as that number, and that will be my geometric output. And if you look closely at this, um, you may notice that this is similar to the exponential random number generator. So if you remember that P is a constant, your exponential random variant generator that you use, uh, let's say uh, on the ICAs you've used it, uh, then that, and we talked about it last time, that has a natural log 1 minus R, and then it has a mean out front. 
Well, that mean is just a constant, and so is this just a constant. So this looks like a discrete version of the exponential, which makes sense because if you look at this formula here, uh, then you can kind of think of this as a, as a, you've got these probabilities that keep multiplying, or if you even think of it conceptually, it's the time until, like let's say I'm at, if I say uh, that the time until the first failure, well, that's like a waiting time distribution. So this is like the discrete version of an exponential waiting time. So it's kind of not surprising that I'm just quantizing what is effectively an exponential random number generator. So, mm -hmm. so that's why it's not sort of a mistake that that looks just like the exponential. But not all of these random variant generators that you use will end up looking that way. It's just the reason it looks that way is it's effectively the discrete version of an exponential. It is also memoryless for a minute. But the thing I might want you to focus on is, in principle, if I gave you a formula for the CDF, you could set up a similar sandwich inequality like this, and then solve it to end up generating an inverse transform generator that has a nice closed form for a discrete output. Any questions about that? Just kind of concludes our discrete inverse transform. All right, so um, if you wanted to implement this in ARENA, ARENA doesn't have a ceiling function, but it has this am int function, which is like, um, it's like, it's the, it basically is a rounding function. It finds the closest integer. So if you want to implement ceiling, what I do is just to add 0.5 to the argument and then do am int around that. So this am int 0.5 plus is effectively the ceiling, and that's what's inside the ceiling. So that is a way that we can generate geometric random variables uh, inside ARENA without having to manually put in every probability into the disk function. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so with the and int function, it's like the nearest integer, and if I don't want the nearest integer, I want the, the, the integer that is at least, I want the smallest integer that is at least as big as this thing. So by adding 0.5, if I'm, you know, that, that sort of forces me. Any other questions? All right, so the big takeaway that from that lecture, and so I'm skipping a lot of this kind of, I, I mentioned, you know, I said if you couldn't sleep at night because you're afraid of what happens if I don't have an inverse CDF and it's not possible to solve, I said there are ways to deal with that. And, um, and I, we don't go over those, uh, I, I put, extra slides on that in case there were time for just sort of for information's sake. In more advanced classes like, I don't know, IE 545, you might end up like actually going into how to say sample from a normal. We all very often sample from a normal distribution and fortunately ARENA gives us a function that already does that. But if you actually want to ask how do you sample from a normal, that's very complicated because the CDF of a normal, although we know how to write that, the inverse CDF of a normal does not have a closed form expression. So you cannot use the inverse transform method directly with a normal distribution. So we have to come up with other ways to sample from a normal. A normal, say a gamma, a beta, a bunch of other common uh, distributions. And there are ways to do that. They're just kind of outside of the scope of this class. But just know that these things exist. And then also, um, if once we can sample from a normal, one of the cool things we can do that's very difficult to do with other distributions, is we can create correlated random numbers. So we can say, what if I want my inter-arrival time to be correlated with my service time? In other words, the longer you wait for someone to arrive, the longer they're probably going to take in service. If you have a system that you believe that's the case, and you want those two things to be correlated, then the question is, how do I manage to draw from two distributions and ensure that there's maybe a 60% correlation between them? Well, it turns out it's very easy to do that only if you have two normal random variables. You can mix them arithmetically and get that correlation. But it's difficult to do that with any other random variables. And so there is a method called the normal to anything or NORTA method where you can take two correlated normals and turn them into two correlated anything else's. So that's where that normal to anything. And so in more advanced simulation methods, whereas we focus primarily on inverse transform, they use the inverse transform to build up to the NORTA. 
and then you use the Norda for like everything, because in those cases you might actually have to be forced to build those correlations. So, um, so those these methods do also exist. Uh, so, but fortunately, Arena has done a lot of this work for us for the common good ones. And if you have approximations of other distributions that Arena doesn't have, you've always got disk and cost that you can lean on. All right, so any questions about the discrete sampling stuff before we go into the midterm? All right, so um, the midterm review, just as a reminder here, and then I'll take questions or I can get the slides again. Oh, okay. Well, now I, I thanks for mentioning. I'll go and fix that. Um, okay. So that was apparently a Canvas mistake that I can take care of that. Um, okay. So um, the midterm midterm retake, they're both here, but one's about a week and a half after the other one. Both of them are going to be closed book and closed notes. On both of them, you can have two two sided handwritten formula sheets. I say handwritten. Um, if you really want to, you know, type it up or something, that's fine. But when we look at your formula sheet, it shouldn't have anything photocopied out of a homework, out of a book, or whatever. You can hand copy something out of a homework, that's fine. But we want you to we'll force you to recreate it, either by typing or by writing. Uh, so uh, no need to copy numbers from the back of the book, chi squared tables, KS, that sort of thing. Um, I will give you tables with numbers. Um, if there's formulas that you think you might like, like the linear congruential generator, that's like a good thing to put in your formula sheet. Uh, exam will have an A and a B version, and I'm, I'm almost definitely going to be using Scantron for this. I'll bring a box of number two pencils. It's good if you have your own pencil, too. If you, uh, if you do with the Scantron and pen, it just gets returned to me, and I have to hand grade it. Um, and so I don't guarantee that I will hand grade it. So yeah, bring a pencil or use a pencil that I provide. Um, I, Something that I guess a lot of other people don't do, but I really like to do, is to make use of the multiple bubble answers. And so sometimes I'll say select all, or sometimes I'll give you more than five options. And then so you'll not only have A, B, C, D, and E, but you'll have A, B, and A, C, and A, B. I mean, you can get, you know, imagine lots of combinations. So I can give you a huge list that you know I can encode in five bubbles. And so, um, and then the big people would ask, <laughs> do I really do bubble more than one? And yes, you do. I can also ask four questions. So, so be prepared for those. Don't be surprised if you see those. Um, every question will be one point. So, I, I, and I don't. So there's no partial credit. So you might spend five minutes doing a math problem and then bubble in one thing, or you might spend ten seconds, you know, doing a concept question. And the rationale I have for this, um, although I will try to break quantitative ones up into maybe multiple questions, which is kind of uh, a discrete approximation of partial credit. But, uh, but the, sort of the, the rationale here is as much as we want you to do chi-squared tests by hand in class, all of you know you're never going to do a chi-squared by hand ever again. And, and likewise, in a job interview, no one's going to ask you uh, to do a chi-squared by hand. Well, they might, but, you know, it's just because they're boring. <laughs> but, but, nobody's, but, but what they might ask you is what statistical test would you use if? And it's those concept questions that I think are the ones that will that are, are more valued because there always are tools that can do quantitative stuff for you. So we want you to know how to do the quantitative stuff, but leaving this class, you're all getting, you're not seniors, you'll be seniors soon. Uh, we want to make sure that the concept stuff is really solidified. So that's why, even though you might think, oh, you know, you just ask me, I just, you know, if something is an exponential or a Poisson, and I bubbled an exponential, that doesn't seem like the same line of work as, you know, solving a runs test. But to me, it's just as um, and then the exam is worth 20% of your course grade, and you can take the highest of these two. If you don't want to come to one, that's fine. Just get a zero for it, and then your grade will be the other one. Any questions about the format or anything? The inspiration for my questions that, uh, you know, maybe today that I'll put together um, is basically this. Um, so there's going to be a bunch of multiple cho choice questions where I'm going to ask about concepts, uh, DS, superhero number generators, probability distributions, which one does this, which one does that. Um, very basic arena expressions, disk, cont, um, you know, things like that. Uh, definition related fill in the blank questions, picking the name of tests, 
maybe some simple calculations. I might show you a hand simulation that will have gaps in it, and you'll have to maybe fill in those gaps. Uh, make uh, I might show you some graphs of PDFs and CDFs, which one is the PDF, which one is the CDF. Um, and then I might give you number sequences and say which one of these violates, it clearly violates the independence property, something like that. Um, numerical problems. So a couple of these where maybe you have to do um, a small, like four or five lines, maybe just four lines of a DES by hand. And then I'll ask you for some cumulative statistic that you'll only get right if you've done all of those lines. Or maybe I'll ask you to generate a sequence of random numbers and I'll ask you for the fifth in that sequence. Uh, or maybe I'll have you do statistical tests of uniformity or independence using the chi squared of KS or the runs test. And then the design problem, so definitely expect to have to design a continuous random variant generator and maybe a discrete random variant generator. I think on the sample that I gave from last semester, I asked people to do both. So I have a tiny discrete random variant generator problem and then a little larger continuous random variant. I probably won't ask you to do both the integration and the inversion all in one step. That way you don't like mess up one. But I probably might ask you something, you know, I could ask you to, you know, integrate to get the CDF in one question, and then I'll give you a CDF in another question and ask you to turn that into an English transform in that question. And then again, the answer might be, well, here's a random number, tell me what the outcome would be with the integration. So questions about the format? or just in general. Any questions? I mean, so from here on out, the way I've got this structured, and I don't have to do any of this. I can just switch to, uh, I can just switch to a tablet here and then take sort of notes on the board and post these after, um, you know, based on your questions and your work problems or whatever. But the way I've got it structured is I've got kind of feedback from the, the three homeworks, just kind of common problems and common solutions, things to look out for, and then a review of kind of, and this is meant to be kind of an inventory, or almost a study guide of things that I think are the most important out of the lectures we've had so far. We don't have to get to any of that. If there are burning questions that any of you have, yeah. Can you explain, for example, how to do the treatment? Yeah, okay. Um, so, do that. so the question was, um, you know, how to use a discrete random number, or how to build a discrete random number. Well, so LCG, is, uh, so the linear congregation generator, that's how to generate the UO ones. So the discrete random variant generator is if I were to give you, I might say that, you know, here's an outcome. So I might say that there's, here is a PMF. And I will say that, you know, this outcome is going to be have a 20% probability. And maybe this outcome, I'll call it phi, will have a 70% probability. And some other outcome, say 10, has a uh, whatever's left over, which I think is 10%. And I might then say that, you know, every other outcome, if I forget to say this, I'll mean this. Uh, I'll say so for all other x. So the idea here is I've got this, um, I, you know, there's only three outcomes, and each one of them like, use up all of the probability. And then I might ask, like, all right, so generate a discrete random variant generator. So the way I would ask that on a multiple choice exam is I'd say, let's, I might, I might do something tricky and I might give you a list of uniformly distributed random numbers. So I might say that there's um, this, you've got a uniformly distributed random variant generator that gave you this list of 0 0.14, 0 0.6, whatever. So you'd imagine uh, like a list of numbers between 0 and 1. And then I might say, um, using, you know, working from left to right, generate a single, or maybe I'll say generate two or whatever, but I'll say generate a single random variant from the desired distribution up top there. So you would have to know that, all right, I need to then grab, um, so you would have to know that I am eventually going to plug this into my random variant. So what does my random variant generator look like? Well, I'm not asking you to show your work, right? Because I'm just, just a multiple choice uh, test. 
So you can solve this in a number of different ways. The way I might solve this is just to say, well, I know my cumulative, if I were to write my cumulative distribution, so I'll do f of x, I could say, well, f of anything less than 1 is equal to 0, f of 1 is equal to 0.2, f of 5 is equal to 0.9, and f of 10 is equal to 1.0. And so then my question is, well, I guess I'll maybe ask you guys, so then the question here is, what do I do if I were to draw a, one, a point 4, which outcome would this correspond to? I heard a point 2. Why do you say point 2? Um, okay, so so how, okay. Well, I guess we, so we've got the outcomes here. So these are our outcomes. I'll highlight some of these. So basically, our choices for outcomes are these guys: one, five, and ten. Um, so one. Why do we say one? There we go. Right. So. Here, if I look at um, this number here, 0.04, that falls within this interval. And so that means that it corresponds to that outcome, the next outcome. So if you were to write the CDF, you find where the random number falls, and then you go to the next outcome. So if I were to then say, okay, well, let's say I wanted to draw two random variables. Well, then I have to know, well, the next random variant is 0.6. So let's say that it's okay for r equal to 0.6. Then what outcome corresponds to r equal to 0.6? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can kind of think of me moving from right to left as the inverse of the other. From you know, your right. So, any guesses? So, for if I drew r equals 0.6 and I wanted to generate an outcome uh, consistent with an inverse transform, then what would the outcome be? Five. Okay, cool. Great. Um, so, so, if I were to go to my highlighter here and I'll say, okay, so. This interval here, that's where that one goes into, and so that goes to that outcome. And so we could do this all day. But that's basically, I might give you more outcomes than that. I won't give you too many more, but, uh, but the basic idea is you're just going to cut, you zero one up. You're basically going to, you're generating a number line, really. It's like the random dark method in the book. And so you're just going to take in, you know, an interval from zero to one, and you're just going to you're deciding on cut points that where each one of these is proportional to the probability mass of that particular outcome. And so, uh, you know, you take the outcomes in order as that I give them to you, and you then create these cut points, and then you draw random numbers, and it's like the dark story in here, and then you see which side of the cut points they go on, and then that will tell you which outcome. So this outcome owns this space, this outcome owns this space, and so on. And that's just what we did here with the transverse. Any questions about that, about drawing from discrete random variables and then the inverse transform? And I'll post this uh, PDF online. Any other general, yeah, uh, was that a question? For this one, no, you don't, the only outcomes you worry about are these, these three here, 1, 5, and 10, because I've set up there that the probability mass is zero everywhere else. So it, it only the only possible outcomes are 1, 5, and 10. Now, I might give you I, I, it's something arbitrary. I could give you, this could have been P of 1,000, and then that would be zero. But just for this one, you only have to worry about 1, 5, and 10. Does that make sense? That's right.
Yes. So that that's so this is the screen. So that's the continuous. So definitely be able to, if I give you a probability density function, be able to generate a CDF. And if I give you a CDF, be able to invert the CDF to do the same thing here, to draw that, uh, to be able to draw it out. My question is actually for the discrete, do we have to be able to fill the inverse transform function? Um, well, so, I mean, the, the only case that I've shown you that is that case of like the geometric, where I could, where, like, so that, that geometric example would be one where I probably, it would be unlikely, I'm, I'm willing to say, as long as, and I'll take your word for it, that you will study that, that one slide that I had today on the geometric one where we've got an analytical expression, that's what the ceiling function for drawing these, then I won't put something like that on the exam. So all the discrete draws will be probably something like this, or they, they're not gonna ask you about the formula um, with respect to the discrete draws. I could say, you know, generate your inverse transform generator and then add up all the exponents, and then that will be your answer, right? And so that, you know, so I could ask you about making sure you got the right formula for your inverse transform generator for the continuous one. But for the discrete one, because we have to do it kind of so rarely, I'm okay with you just kind of mastering this and focusing your effort. Yeah. For example, when you have square roots, ah. mm -hmm. um, when you're choosing like the sign for a square root, do you have to take that into account with x, y? That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah, so that's a common problem, and you definitely would expect to see that on a midterm. If I give you, um, you know, some, if I give you something like F, so I'm going to write something that won't actually be a CDF, just because I don't want to take the time to make sure it, well, actually, maybe I can get it right. No, I'm not going to bother. Uh, but, so, you know, if, if I were to say F of X is equal to, you know, X squared, but it's only defined on the domain from zero to infinity, then if I were to do an inverse transform of that, or uh, then, well, let's say, I'll just make this easier. Actually, I can make it really easy. I'm going to make it just defined from 0 to 1. All right. Anybody off the top of their head know what CDF this is? All right. Okay. That's fine. Um, so, um, so the, the, so if, if this were the case here, so the reason I said this is a CDF, is that f of 0, equal to zero, and f of one is equal to one, and it's monotonically increasing between there. So it, it checks all our boxes for CDF. Um, so if I wanted to invert this thing, well, the inverse of this algebraically looks easy. So I can just set r equal to x squared, and then I can solve, and I get x is equal to, remember that is t minus square root um, of r. And I know that my r is going to be between 0 and 1. And so the question is, how do I make sure that my x is going to be in whatever the x range was? Now, here I said the x is defined between 0 and 1. So I would then make the choice of saying, all right, so in that case, x is equal to the positive square root of r. But I could have also said what if my f of x is also equal to x squared, but my outcomes go from negative 1 to 0. So now I'm saying that I have a, uh, it's, you know, it, has, it ha happens to have the same formula for the CDF, but all my outcomes are negative, or negative or you know, negative 1, they're non-positive. And so here, I can go through the same math, and I'm still stuck with this plus or minus question. And in this case, I have to choose the minus because I know that my outcomes are all negative. So you have to, the output of your random variant generator has to produce outcomes that are in the kind of input of your CDF. So if your CDF is defined on negatives, then your outcomes on your inverse transform better give you negatives. And this goes for the piecewise versions too. So if you're solving a, a tiny piece of the CDF, and that piece of the CDF has a bunch of negatives in it, then you need to make sure that you choose your square roots to generate those negatives. Now, 
I, it happened to be that the negative choice here corresponded to the negative one here, but algebraically there, there could have been like this, this could have been there, there might have been other things in this expression, and that might have made it like actually choosing the plus here is the thing that produces the negative. So you just have to think it through. Like if I chose a negative here, what would ultimately happen to x? And does that x land in the range of x? Uh, that's all I hit first. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, they would be the, the same because because I didn't it wasn't piecewise. Yeah. But if this was a piecewise CDF, um, so if I was like doing if I had an f of x equal to something, so it's going to be whatever x squared from negative 0.5 to 0, and it will be something else, you know, this won't necessarily be a CDF, but it will be whatever, point two five plus x squared from 0 to 0 0.5, or something like that. So in this case, I would have to say, well, all right, so I know that this top one, if I were to plug negative 0.5 into there, I can see that this this top one maps to an R range from 0 0.25 to 0. I've written these backwards just because I'm trying to map the 0 0.5 goes to 0 0.25 and 0 goes to 0. And this bottom one maps to, um, so this is going to be 0.25. Again, this is going to fail as a CDF, but I'm just trying to demonstrate a perfect uh, demonstrate how this works. So then the 0.5 goes into there, that becomes a 0.25, they add together, and it gives us the 0.5. So actually it doesn't, it still, it still works the way, the way I wanted it to work. But So this interval goes from 0 to 0 0.25, and that came from plugging in these values. This interval goes from 0.25 to 0.5, and that came from plugging in those values. And it is this x range that you have to choose your square roots to be consistent with. When your r is in this range. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there was a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's a good question. So um, I think I actually let me flip back to the slides because I think I've got a can. Example that if I do, will be easier for me to try to come up with something. So here is um, a simple example that is a real PMF and a real. PDF or CDF. So um, I have this PDF, and the temptation is to integrate each piece. So I integrate under zero, I get. If I integrate under each piece, and if I integrate under zero, I get zero. If I integrate under 0 0.25, I get 0.25x. 1.5, 1.5x, 0, 0. That's the temptation. But it's wrong, it's incorrect as a CDF, because the, the it goes from it starts at zero the way a CDF starts at, but it doesn't end at one. So it should have a one down here in this box if we've done it correctly. So the question is how do we add the constants in properly to make this work? And so the the most general form of this, as I say, is we break these things up. And so let me try to make this a little more concrete. So for this top range here, from negative infinity to 0.5, that's this range here, I know that I'm just integrating under zero. So I take the integral from negative infinity to x under zero, where x goes up to 0.5. And so that's just going to give me a zero. Now for this, this is where you know, potentially you can get one of these constants out. For this range from 0.5 to 1.5, then I integrate under the original this this curve 
all the way up to 0.5. And then I start integrating under this curve from 0.5 all the way up to 1.5. And so in this case, the original curve just had zero under it, so there's nothing out front. But this is where one of those constants could have gotten added in. So then now this integral I can take, and, uh, and then that, I just have to remember how to properly integrate the limits. And so that's another place where these constants get added. Because if I just take the antiderivative, it's 0.25x. But once I put in those limits, then I get 0.25x minus 0.25 times 0.5. And so that's another place where those constants can come in. So the constants either are kicked down uh, from the previous step, or they come out of using the limits of integration, where the limits of integration went from 0.5 to x, well, there's the 0.5, and there's the x. So if you keep doing this process, then down here, <clears throat> you have all of those things combined. And so I've got my zero from my first piece. The second piece here is if I integrate under 0.25, from 0.5 to 1.5, I get this. 0.25x, where x is 1.5, and then that 0.25, uh, so this is 0.25x evaluated at 1.5 minus 0.25x evaluated at 0.5. And then I, and that gives me this thing. And then I'm finally left with integrating this from 1.5 to x, and then that's going to introduce additional constants from the limits. And so you're constantly just accumulating, which is the point of a cumulative uh, uh, distribution function, accumulating all the prior constants and then adding in your own. Does that make sense? So just any other questions about yeah. You you have to go through the whole procedure because you after modeling you do a stochastic model, and it and it comes up, and you just come up with some PDF, some generic PDF that says this is a model of how of demand in this inventory system, or this is a model of how people arrive to this restaurant. And that model, that stochastic model, may not look like anything that's just out of the textbook. It may not look like a normal distribution. It may have some arbitrarily shaped PDF. And so the question is then, how do I simulate? you know, virtual entities that behave according to that. And that's why we need these random variant generators. So it gives us a way to take any arbitrary PDF like this one that you've gotten, you've used your kind of, you know, stochastic operations research to build this PDF, all the sort of basic stuff you know about probability and modeling. You built the PDF, and now we have to solve for the CDF and then for the CDF so that the simulator can now draw outcomes that are according to this PDF. Yeah. It, well, it, uh, so without giving away the solution of the homework, um, it is not necessarily incorrect. Or, I mean, so basically the range of random variables could be anything. So it would be incorrect if, if you look at the PDF I gave you and you say the range of this PDF is positive, but I'm getting negative numbers out, then it would be incorrect. But if you look at this PDF, and so for this PDF, I can see that there are, um, from there are, it's zero all the way up to a positive number. So for this PDF, I should never get any negative numbers out of my random variant generator. But for the PDF I gave you on the homework, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, if that PDF put some density in the negative numbers, you better get negative numbers. Other questions? Okay. Well, then if other questions come up, just I'm just going to flip through some of these things. And as we kind of marinate in them, if other questions come up, then just let me know and we can divert. But um, but basically, if I jump back, uh, so some quick feedback on the homework um, and problems that I'll see on the homework, but I'll also see on the midterm. Some of them uh, are subtle, which is why I want to make sure I just mention them.
All right, so um, yeah, so homework B1. Um, hopefully everybody feels comfortable about activities, delays, events, how they all relate together. If there are any questions about that, let me know. I'm just going to use kind of a study guide here. Um, but um, so we're going to get to some of the quantitative things here. Um, you know, events, again, so be, be comfortable about the difference between an event and an activity and how an activity always has an event at its start and an event at its end. But um, a delay is sort of the result of these activities stacking up funny. Um, getting to the quantitative stuff, if I ask you to generate random number generators, um, so always remember to divide by the modulus. So a lot of people, they'll generate the kind of internal workings of that random number generator, which will be like a five-digit number, but then they'll forget to divide by 100,000 or 10,000 or whatever I give you the modulus is. And so, um, so make sure you divide by, by that. Um, also, if I give you a C, the first, if I ask you to like generate five random numbers, the first random number shouldn't be calculated directly from the C. You should go through the process once, and the first random number should be that first output. Because the seed, we kind of know, and so it'd be easy, that's not really a random number. The random number comes from the arithmetic kind of being unpredictable in what it's going to produce next. And so the first number is the one you get from processing the seed, not from the seed itself. Um, other things, weird arithmetic things that come up just, I think, because we're not used to working with numbers that much. Like, you know, at some point in our career, we work with all, you know, variables, and then you forget, like, you just become unaccustomed to working at numbers. And so we end up grading a lot of these things that finally people don't very, you know, when they're comparing numbers, like the back of the stats table, like, I'll see this mistake come up with, like, we'll be comparing the point 0.127, and they'll say that point 0.127 is greater than point 0.18, you know? So, like, those are easy, like, by eye mistakes to make, and just, just be careful, you know, not making them. Likewise, they'll get a lot of these like place value things where like 71 over 1,000 will, you know, will drop the leading zero. So be careful about that. Um, just general ordering of place value issues. So I don't think that if people don't remember how place value works. I just think that like you just are working quickly and visually is kind of like just very quickly like, oh, okay, well, um, you know, that's 18 and that's 127 and I'm just going to go. Um, the uh, degrees of freedom, uh, the Remember that you actually have to look for the KS, uh, you have to change the degree of freedom with the number of data, and you also have to, whatever critical value I give you, the uh, type 1 error rate, uh, you know, it's always going to be 0.05 on the exam. Change it, because you're pretty much accustomed to that, but the amount of data I give you could change. So even though you might have remembered 0.457 from an example you did, because I give you six data points, it might be 0.521 on the exam. So, careful about that. Uh, when you're answering these questions, uh, you know, so this was more uh, for the homework, but don't just say we've rejected the null. You know, tell me what you've rejected. You know, so then tell me the conclusion. Does that mean they're sort of uniform or not uniform? What does it mean? Uh, then the D2, we've already gone over the first, you know, bulk of this, which was that uh, the making the CDF. But then choosing intervals to invert that's another thing that people sometimes have trouble with, but a good rule is that if the piece of the CDF is constant, it's not going to make a difference in the inversion. And you can just think of that graphically. If I'm you know, mapping a random number on the, on the y-axis, if there's a constant value, it's not going to hit anything. So we only care about where, there's, where an x shows up or where you don't get a constant value. And so in this case, for this CDF, we only care about these middle two rows. These are the only ones we have to worry about inverting. If we do it right, then we'll end up mapping this interval from 0.5 to 2 to the interval from 0 to 1. So the inverse CDF maps that interval back. And uh, so we need to get into that. We'll end up doing this inverse. And so we've got this top one here. So we've already kind of solved some of these problems. Um, oh, I might. I guess something to point out is even in some of the examples, the cut point has been 0.5, and you just went to that 2, but it's not always 0.5. So you have to sort of figure out what that cut point is by plugging in these boundary values into the CDF. And then that will end up telling you what these cut points are. So, so this is just the same stuff from the homework. So there's an example here. 
having to go through that if that was uncomfortable. And then the other um, problem is if you have a square, we've already kind of talked about this. This x plus one square, it could, you know, this whole bowl is described by x plus one square. But then the question when you're inverting is do I take this portion or this portion? And that's where knowing where your outcomes are supposed to be is helpful. So I know my outcomes are supposed to be from negative two up through, you know, whatever the zero. And I know that this parabolic outcomes are only supposed to be from negative one to zero. So I better choose my inverse so that I select for those outcomes. So uh, this, when I do the inverting process in this square root, I chose a plus because I knew my outcomes were from negative one or higher. They didn't go from negative one to lower. So that's why I chose a plus. So any questions about any of those? Otherwise, moving forward here, it's just, you know, I just go back through, um, you know, make sure you're comfortable with you know, what do I mean by stochasticity? How does that involve randomness? Um, you know, know the definitions of these things that show up in arena, entities, attributes, resources, state variables. Um, know how to do a hand simulation. Um, now that we've gotten to arena, uh, just I added this little image here. There's a step inside of arena next to the play button. And that actually is moving through the internal event calendar that arena calculates. And so if you're ever, you know, running through arena, uh, and you, you effectively have a timeline of events that Arena has figured out. And every time you hit step, it's doing what you do in the hand simulation. So make sure you're comfortable with looking at these. Make sure you know those activities and how these are activities and how those both differ from these delays. Um, probability, know of uh, several distributions. Know um, the rough properties of these distributions and when you would use them. Um, know the rough properties of these distributions and know when you would use them. Um, know that a Poisson counting process, how it relates to both an exponential and a Poisson. Um, and then the random variance stuff, which is what we kind of covered in the first half. Any other final questions? If any other questions come up, feel free to use the discussion board. That way everybody else can see the answers. Or you can email me or the Q&A is directed. Um, let's do an attendance question then. So let's get to one of those slides. Yeah, know the runs test. Um, even though you didn't do it on home on homework. I uh, know you know which one of these is a CDF, which one of these is a PDF, and so on. And so for your attendance question, uh, let's say, uh, should you bring a pen to the exam? That is the attendance. The answer is no. Mm-hmm. 